Well, good evening. I'm so thrilled to add my welcome to each and every one of you to CHM tonight. It's a very special night to talk about the Intuit story, a quintessential Silicon Valley story. Its story begins in 1983, and today its software from QuickBooks, Turbo, and Mint is used by 50 million people around the world. And as we talk about that story, it's, it's still unfolding. And so we're asking these questions. You know, why did Fortune magazine describe Intuit as, as the Tom Brady, right, of its industry performing at the top of its game when many of its competitors are, are long gone? Um, and how does the company founded in 1983 reinvent itself uh, to, to be as relevant, if not more, today with a market cap of over $66 billion and voted as one of the top 100 places to work? We have much to learn from the Intuit story, and who better to tell it than the people at the heart of the story? And as is tradition, I'll introduce our, four, our three speakers and our panelists through five numbers. First, Scott Cook, co-founder of Intuit, serves as the chairman of the executive committee. He works with small teams still across the company uh, and also serves as president of the Intuit Scholarship Foundation. So here are Scott's five numbers. Zero, the number of VCs who invested in Intuit after pitching to 25 of them <laughs> in 1984. Two, the number of months it took QuickBooks to become the market leader. 250, the ratio of into its current market cap compared to its IPO in 1993. 50, the percentage of direct, report to, direct reports to into its new CEO, um, newly promoted CEO, who are women. <laughs> That's right. And 341, the number of Intuit employee kids winning scholarships from Scott and his wife, Signe. <laughs> Next, Tom Pruel. Co-founded Intuit, developed the first version of Quicken, which would become the nation's uh, best-selling personal finance software, and has been a very active investor uh, and advisor to startups since then. Here are Tom's five numbers. 1983, the year he met uh, Scott Cook at Stanford and started into it. 120 plus hours a week uh, for six weeks of nonstop coding for Quicken 2.0. <laughs> 125,000, the budget for the direct advertising campaign su suggested by Pru in 1986, betting enti uh, into its entire um, budget there, moved into it from the brink of bankruptcy uh, to runaway success. 1047 Games, the name of the video game startup that he spends his time on nowadays, started by his son Ian. It's here. Uh, the game just launched. The title is Splitgate Arena Warfare. Last but not least, 64, the days it took for him to ride his bicycle from San Diego to Florida last fall, accomplishing his number one bucket list item. So, Eric Dunn joined into it during its earliest days, took on concurrent roles as CFO and also a software engineer, later serving as its first uh, CTO. He led the development of Quicken for Windows and served uh, as general manager, is now CEO for Quicken. Here are Eric's five numbers. 65% the rise in Intuit stock price in March of 1993 when it IPO'd. Uh, of course, Eric was CFO at the time. Four, the number of Intuit's workforce uh, when he joined in 1996, or his employee number. 20,000, 20,000. The number of individual faulty disks that he and the team fixed and manually shipped out <laughs> to customers in three days, um, bolstering Intuit's reputation for customer service. <laughs> Seven months uh, to lead a team of engineers um, that led to Quicken uh, for Windows in 1991, 20, the number of years worked at Intuit before becoming CEO of Quicken in 2016. Eric. <laughs> when we were thinking about who could help bring together these people to tell this story, we thought of who would know, have known it from the very beginning and who has been involved, who is somebody who understands uh, companies, entrepreneurship, reinvention in technology. Of course, we found 
the very best person, that's Peter Wendell. He's the founder and managing uh, director of Sierra Ventures, a venture capital firm that's invested more than $2 billion over the past 30 years uh, in early stage and emerging growth technology companies. He's also helped originate and manage the uh, Sierra Ventures investment in Intuit and has been a longtime advisor to Scott and others. He's also a beloved part of the Stanford faculty, at, uh, the faculty at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Here are Peter's five numbers. 1982, the year that he founded Sierra Ventures in Menlo Park, California. 2.2 million, the dollars invested by Sierra uh, Ventures and Intuit Series A financing. 2,000 plus, the number of MBAs at Stanford that he's been that he's taught over the past 28 years. 25 plus, the companies in the US and around the world that he served on the board of directors. And six, the number of children that he and his uh, wife, Lynn, have in their family. Please give me a very, very warm welcome to all of our speakers for tonight. Thank Great you to have you here. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Tom. Good evening to everyone. Let me add my welcome. Thank you for being here. We have uh, a great uh, hour and 20 minutes in front of us. We'll have uh, Q&A from the audience later on, submitted in the way uh, Daniel spoke about. But um, for now, let's start with the very beginning. I think most in the audience would agree that every company starts with an idea with uh, an experience, with uh, some sort of happening that uh, the founder says, aha, maybe there's something there. Uh, maybe there's an idea. Maybe there's an opportunity on which I can build and capitalize. So Scott, back in uh, 1983, tell us what, was, what were you thinking? What, uh, what were you feeling? What were you seeing? Uh, that uh, made Intuit come to be? And what were the first couple of things you did once you had those feelings and instincts and insights? Well, the initial aha moment was um, pretty straightforward. My wife, Signe, who's right here, complained about doing the bills for our family. <laughs> and she's very good at it. It wasn't a quality problem, but it was just... <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says here. Um, <laughs> no, she really is. It, but it was, it's a hassle. Who wants to do this? Uh, a distraction from life. So it went, ding, wait a minute. Here sounds like a classic problem that everybody would have where these new things called personal computers could solve that problem and could automate the process. So that was the aha. And that kind of sprung from, it was the kind of problem I was Met Signe at P&G, and that's kind of a classic P&G problem. Find a problem everyone has, like uh, babies poop, or you get cavities, you got to get dirt out of your clothes, <laughs> and f use technology what, what to solve it. Ba babies poop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they've done Pampers and Tide and Crest. So, and so that was the idea. But then the next step was okay. Well, maybe we're unusual. Maybe we're not representative. Is this a problem that regular people have? So I went and got the phone books in the Palo Alto Library and called households in Palo Alto and Winnetka and asked them about their personal finances, what things they do, what things they don't do, what they like, what they don't like. And it seemed consistent with my hunch. OK, everyone has to pay bills, keep a check register, and back then occasionally reconcile it to the bank. And nobody wants to do it. So that was, that was the kind of the initial aha. Then the challenge was, OK, ha, ah, somebody has to code this. <laughs> and that's what led to Tom and I getting together. Um, so how, how is it that you encountered uh, Tom? I mean, we're in Silicon Valley. Even back then, there were a lot of people who could code. How did you get together? Well. I'll give just the beginning, and then Tom can give the meat of the story. But I didn't really, well, I knew one guy who could code, uh, but he didn't want to join this, so I had to go find someone. So I decided to hang posters on the bulletin boards at uh, Stanford Engineering Department and uh, Berkeley and um, San Jose State. You know, wanted software engineer to work on a really cool product, uh, call Scott. 
little uh, tear off things at the yeah, bottom. Yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> Very sophisticated. So then I got to Stanford and I didn't know where to do that, hang this. So I found some students sitting outside what I thought was the engineering library. And that's what it was. Tom can pick it up from there. And then what happened? <laughs> So, well, just to back up a, 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 a slight moment, because before this meeting, and the reason that it, it ended up clicking when Scott came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, where would be a good place to hang these posters? I was, at that time, I had decided I wanted to start a PC software company. And I had another year to go because I was going to get my master's degree at Stanford in addition to my bachelor's. And so I was starting to think about it. And all I had figured out was I wanted to do a mass market kind of product for PCs because I was really uh, I had really been inspired by Steve Jobs, and uh, but I had another year to kind of think about it. So my antenna were up, and then this guy comes up to me, taps me on the shoulder. He's got a handful of flyers. and says, "Hey, where would be a good place to post these flyers advertising for programmers?" So I told him. Mm -hmm. I said, "But." Tell me about this a little bit. And uh, so he told me, he told me what he just told you, that you know, he had done this research, that his wife had had this kind of aha moment, and, and had, you know, this, you know, and it was like instantly obvious to me this was the idea. This was that mass market PC idea that I was searching for. And uh, so we, we talked, we had a few conversations, and I told him somewhere early in, the converse, in, uh, in our conversation, I said, look, uh, I don't want to program for you. I want to start a company with you, and uh, I'll do this with you as a co-founder. Did you uh, throw the uh, posters in the trash bin? I <laughs> didn't, and he says that I did, but I didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> what, Tom, <laughs> what Tom didn't tell me is it was dead week it was before dead finals. Week. Nobody was looking at the bulletin right. boards. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, let's uh, get you in the conversation, then we'll go back to Tom's uh, early activities. But uh, you came a couple of years later, and uh, what attracted you to this situation? Well, to some extent, it was a little bit like Tom's story. I had uh, been kind of enthralled by this new piece of technology called the personal computer. I was working at Bain & Company as a management consultant, but what I loved was coding. And, you know, I was intrigued by the idea of, you know, doing, having an impact in the personal computer software space, I brought my prototype of the calendar program I'd written to Scott, and he said no in a really nice way that, <laughs> that made me want to keep working with these guys. And uh, so Tom and Scott invited me to be a beta tester of their Apple II uh, product, and then we started talking about you know, whether there were some small programming projects I could do. And so one thing led to another, and after knowing him for about six or eight months, we found a way to work together going forward. And then the small programming project was the one that was up on the board, the <laughs> rewrite of the product, the Quicken 2.0. <laughs> Yep. Giant project. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about how we got Quicken 1.0, which was uh, the first project that Tom took on. Now, we should show, show the audience Tom's uh, maturity and wisdom that he, do we have that picture of Tom uh, uh, from the uh, Stanford campus? Yes, there is a, a wise seasoned like veteran. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, uh, so, uh, Tom, was what, what was it like coding up uh, Quicken 1.0? I mean, you, it's so different. That you, you, what did you do, Microsoft Basic? You yeah, know, well, tiny constraints. Tell, well, how do you develop something like that? <laughs> well, you know, I knew how to code. Uh, I uh, had never done any work on PCs. That's because Stanford was, you know, it was all mainframes back in those days. And, uh, and we were coding at Stanford in a language called Pascal, which was a, a nice high-level language, which I really enjoyed. Uh, and then uh, and I thought to Scott, I talked to Scott, I said, I think we should do this in Pascal, because I knew it. It's a great language. It's got all these nice features. And Scott went uh, to, um, it was Fred Gibbons, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who was the CEO of Software Publishing, uh, and where Signy worked and said, hey, we're doing this program, we're doing this checkbook kind of program, what do you think, what language? And uh, Fred told them, oh, you should do it in basic. I said, why well, does it make no <laughs> sense? Why would you do it? Because they did all their development in Pascal at the time, so why would, why would right. he be telling us to do it in basic? And I think, in hindsight, I think Scott and I realized way after the fact that it must be that he just didn't understand the scope of what we were doing. Right. He thought we were doing this little <laughs> checkbook thing, right? And uh, <laughs> But I didn't know at the time, and so I said, well, if 
guy who's doing all his work in Pascal thinks we should do it in basic, I guess we'll do it in basic. So we did it in basic. Ugh. And Ugh. about a few months into it, we realized what a <clears throat> massive mistake that was. Uh, <laughs> but by then, we had so much invested in it that we didn't want to just throw it all away and restart. So then we found, or I found, that Microsoft had this compiler for basic. And so we kind of munged it over to, to work with a compiled basic, and that's how we did it. And then when Quicken 2 came along, we threw it out entirely and started from, from scratch. Right. So, um, OK, so you uh, hacked out some uh, version one of the product. Scott had some not totally formed vision for the company. You called a bunch of people in the phone book, and they seemed to think this was a good idea. You had a financial person uh, waiting in the wings. You know, it seems like you had everything except you didn't have any money. Right? I mean, you're like, you didn't have any money. So, um, and that, uh, the team outsourced uh, to you, I think, Scott, you were going to go out and, uh, you know, use your charm, raise some money. Uh, how did it work out? I, I saw some numbers there that didn't look yeah. too encouraging. Uh, um, about as good as the decision to code in basic. Um, <laughs> no, so. Initially, we deferred going out to seek money because we didn't quite have the sterling track record that VCs might expect. Tom was still a student at this point, uh, and I used to be a fat and oil salesman at Procter & Gamble. So we thought, we'll get the product mostly built, and then they won't have doubts about our technical abilities or the product design because they could use it. So that pushed us into 1984. By then, the PC software investing went into a slump. And then we went out sure that we were going to get funded. Absolutely sure. I had no doubt. Because um, we had all this research. We had this research. All, this, we had yes. data. We, all, all those people had in testing. Wisconsin. We had yeah. been testing with um, consumers, and we brought them in to use a version that we had partially gotten working. And then we stopped watch time trial. We observed them. We made changes because we found they didn't understand it. So we were more methodical. Then, and they, we could show how much faster, we were twice as fast as using the competing products, of which there were at least two dozen on the market. So we had all this data. So we thought this would be a slam dunk to get financing. And as you saw in the number, we got flat, turned down, we got nothing. Didn't even get a second meeting with anyone. With a bunch of them. Well, we got second meetings from some who knew me very well. But <laughs> even, <laughs> even my friends didn't invest. <laughs> you had friends? That tells you. you gotta, so yeah, that, uh, that didn't work so well. Thank, uh, thank the Lord for unanswered prayers, yes. because you all got to keep a lot more of the company, and the VC thing worked out uh, down the road. But, but Scott, you know, looking at, at Sierra Ventures, looking at our notes, so there weren't two dozen competitors. There was about 37, 38 like different people trying to do consumer uh, finance. Uh, finance like this. Yeah. The use data on the existing products were that 96% um, of them, after the box was open, they were never used more than once. They were great for bookends, you know, doorstop if you had, but they didn't, this product never got, the category never got much traction. There were 30 or 40 competitors out there, and the way to win the race seemed like adding more and more features, yes. and your original business plan said that in fact you thought you should just have a small number of features. When the 25 people told you no, how did you feel about your vision? I think the, the principle is that the biggest successes in, that we now can see, so now in hindsight, the biggest successes in Silicon Valley have often been non-consensus, totally against what people believed at the time. You know, Google, people said, well, nobody needs another search engine. There's already six of them. Um, but you want to be non-consensus and right. And <laughs> <laughs> You got the first part. <laughs> yeah. Now, so when when is it that you want to be non-consensus when the customers don't follow the consensus? And here, the customers were not using the products that had all those features because they made personal finance hard and slow. And what our research showed is people want it to be fast and easy. So we built a product that was a speedboat. Everyone else had built an ocean liner. And that's why they weren't using it. So we, we knew we were entirely different than the ocean liners. And then we'd done enough testing to know that with regular consumers, because any software product is easy in the hands of its developer. Ours had to be easy in the hands of someone who'd never used a computer. 
and we'd done with this iterative testing that we'd done, we'd shown that. So we, we knew, we had so much evidence we were right and we believed, and it's just that investors were in another paradigm. They were in the feature-heavy paradigm, which is great for enterprise software, but that's not what works at the time. That's not what Holmes needed. Yeah. Tom, were you losing uh, faith as uh, no. uh, <laughs> you were trying to raise money and no one was giving you any? I mean, that's no. No, because of exactly these reasons. We had done our homework. We knew exactly what con consumers wanted. We knew that time savings was the key benefit that mattered more than anything else. We knew from our stopwatch time trials that we were better than all alternatives at saving people time, including, as it turned out, the toughest alternative, which was just not using any software and doing it by hand. We beat everybody. And so we just, I mean, I, maybe naively, but I, I thought at the time, there is no way we can't succeed. We've got this massive problem. We solve it better than any alternative out there. All we've got to do is survive long enough to succeed. And, and we did. <laughs> what did your parents think of what you were doing? <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> uh, I was just a kid straight out of school. I, you know, <laughs> not a big opportunity, of course. I, but I, how I bad? Say, on that quick question, um, my parents really never understood this. They weren't computer or technically oriented. But when we ran out of money, which was a frequent occurrence, they were the ones, after I'd blown through all the money I had and saved in retirement, they were the ones who invested. Now, we did get, when the VC thing didn't work, Tom Lefevre, one of our early teams, said, hey, this VC thing isn't working. Let's go see some rich people. I said, well, I don't know any rich people. And he said, well, I know two. So we went to see them and we got, we wanted $2 million from the VCs. We got 151,000. So that kept the doors open. But then when we burned through that, then my parents were the investors. So they were always willing to support. And heck, your mom did our payroll. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Out of her pocket. <laughs> so how bad, you know, we're trying, I mean, we're talking about the history of Intuit, but we're also, looking for learnings. We're looking at everyone in the audience, everyone's involved with companies, growing their own companies. One thing you've talked about is, um, listen, if you're consensus, maybe that's not as interesting as being non-consensus. Just make sure you're right. From an investor's point of view, you're going to make far more money with someone who's uh, non-consensus uh, and right. Um, you have to have deep conviction because a lot of people are going to tell you no. There's a lot of things. But how, how bad did it get uh, before you were able to raise money? And now, this is before you could possibly afford Eric, so we'll pivot back yes. to him. Yes. <laughs> but, but you two guys, how yeah. bad did it get? What were some of the real low points? Well, the, the, uh, the dark days were when we were totally out of cash. And we, there were seven of us at the time. We had to stop paying salaries, and three of those seven, and by the way, the seven included Scott and me, right? <laughs> so, so three people left because they had bills to pay and couldn't afford to work for free. The two who stayed were uh, Ginny Boyd, who is now my sister-in-law, at the time my, my girlfriend's Girlfriend-in-law. My girlfriend-in-law, <laughs> uh, who is here tonight somewhere. Yes, yes she's there, here. Yeah. There's Jenny. Uh, and uh, Susan Schlangen, who was our manual writer and uh, had become a good friend and, mm -hmm. and uh, somehow had the ability to stay even though she wasn't getting paid. And all of us just, we did what we had to do to survive. We, we, uh, we, we sent back the rented furniture to save costs. We, uh, we brought in furniture from home. We used inventory as furniture. We, uh, we had a lot of unsold inventory. <laughs> we had a lot of unsold inventory. We, uh, uh, my, uh, my girlfriend at the time was working for Crocker Bank. Crocker Bank had just been sold to Wells Fargo, so all the Crocker stationery was getting dumped. She would come home from work every day with a laundry bag or you know, shopping bags full of Crocker stationery that we would use. Yeah. So we just did what we had to do to stay, stay alive. Yeah, I found the, later found uh, the checkbook from checking records from August of that year, and we had no transactions. <laughs> it take, you have to have cash to write checks. It was 85. <laughs> it's a quaint convention yeah. <laughs> that you have. So, uh, so Eric, um, why did you join these guys? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I do think I was negotiating with them at the time the, uh, 
the cruddy furniture was replaced by the really cruddy furniture <laughs> <laughs> when, the, when the rental furniture had to go back to its, to its real owners. I mean, you had more titles uh, than they had employees. Uh, no, no, it, caught, <laughs> it, caught, it caught my attention. Uh, I, uh, I came to work uh, with these guys because I think of two things. One, I've been, you know, as I said, bitten by the software bug. And I think the other thing is I like these guys. And you know, I just thought this would be you know, a great place to work. And whether it succeeded or not, I just thought this was going to be cool. This could be fun. And who knows? It might work. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I felt. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So adversity, I mean, like severe adversity, non-consensus idea, uh, trouble raising money, but enough commitment, so you were just going to do it. You get your girlfriend's sister working there. To, uh, glad everything worked out. <laughs> well, there's a, there's uh, a great story there. We, when we had to stop paying salaries, Jenny had just joined us. And so we announced, we'll pay you for the time you've worked, but everyone, we don't have money to keep paying you. And we dearly- you got precisely one paycheck, I believe. I think it was one paycheck. <laughs> and we dearly love you to stay, but we know you may have to find jobs that actually pay money. Um, and anyway, she then, I found this years later, she called her dad and said, oh, well, they're not just starting, they're not gonna pay. And his advice was, you should stay. You gave them your word you'd work with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, for your dad. When she told me the story, and she must have been thinking, yeah, but didn't they give me a promise they'd pay me? <laughs> Thank goodness. So you can, um, you can imagine uh, Scott and Tom. Let, let put up that uh, picture of Scott and Tom together in the uh, early days, just so you have. You know, this was a pretty lonely uh, place. Uh, <laughs> they don't seem any the worse for it, but. Uh, uh, so, um, so Eric, you came as. Um, CFO, CTO, SBP. No, 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 well, we we no, were doing our due diligence. I, this guy had literally more titles than they had employees in the whole no. company. No, I was, I was, okay. <laughs> what, what, what was your role? My role, my title was, was CFO. I'd been to Harvard Business School, so I thought oh, I could do well, anything. Okay. There you go, right? <laughs> Little did I know. Um, uh, and, you know, I'd like to say I want to be CFO because I correctly predicted it was going to be a, you know, a massive multinational public company with uh, an incredibly uh, complicated financial work to be done. But um, really what I saw was, you know, there was a job that needed to be done as CFO, but there was also a job that needed to be done, which is Tom and I needed to write a new version of Quicken in C. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, they were willing to let me do that and be CFO. And I remember showing to Scott my hand, this job will go up over time, the CFO job, this job will go down over time, and in a couple of years, you know, it'll cross over. And remarkably, that's kind of what happened. It took maybe more like four or five years instead of three years, but, you know, I contributed as a coder, hopefully productively, you know, for quite a few years, and then, you know, later as the CFO. And then let me just jump ahead for one vignette. Uh, so, 10 years after the founding, seven years after Eric joined, we were on the IPO roadshow. It's a late plane flight between cities as, you're, as we're out marketing the IPO. And one of the investment bankers comes to me and says, Scott, what's Eric doing? I said, I don't, I don't know. So I got out of my seat, went up and looked. And, oh, yeah. So I went back and I told the investment banker, he's coding. <laughs> <laughs> don't quit your day job. Yeah. <laughs> So how did this, so after um, things were pretty bleak for a pretty long period of time, and then how did it start to get traction? What, what you know, when, you, when things aren't going well, you try new things. What, what did you do? What changed? How did this thing get off the ground? Well, it, it, I wish there was a, one simple thing, but we, software was sold in boxes then, and it was sold in computer stores. We couldn't get the distributors to take us, so we couldn't get into the computer stores, so we weren't where the shoppers were. So kind of in desperation, um, as a consultant, I'd worked with uh, Wells Fargo, so I went and showed Wells Fargo's head of consumer banking, well, here's what we're building, and he said, oh, well, we might want to sell that to our customers. And so when we didn't have any money to pay for a launch, we actually had Wells Fargo launch it, and of course, they knew how to do PR. We had TV coverage locally, and they announced that they would be selling this great new product, Quicken, to their customers. 
And the great thing about banks is they pay you immediately. And we needed the cash. Uh, <laughs> so then they introduced us to other banks. And by the time the year and a half had gone by, we had 10 banks in 11 states selling Quicken. Or at least we sold Quicken to the banks for them to resell. And that was great. We had cash coming in when we launched the Apple II version. And they had to pay us for those. And that was great, except for one thing. Only one of the banks was able to successfully sell any volume. All the nine out of the 10 banks, it sat in inventory. Because if you're a bank, where do you store something valuable in a bank branch? In the vault. Where do people not shop for software? <laughs> <laughs> so this was almost all of our revenue. And suddenly, I realized I couldn't go out to the next bank and say, sure, this is going to work. Because now, nine out of 10 times, it hadn't. They'd been unable to sell inventory. So I had to stop doing that. And so poof, there went our, our one revenue channel. So um, crisis number two. Uh, yeah. ensued. What happened then? Well, we, then, we, well yeah. We you know, got, as you say, so, so what happened, you know, so this was right during those dark days uh, that we were talking about earlier where we ran out of cash. And so we, this is the second set of dark days. <laughs> uh, well, this was no, the this darkest is, of the, the dark yeah, days. Yeah, this, this is when we were out of cash. And we were, but we were working on our Apple II version at the time. And, uh, and we had to get the Apple II version out, because at least of the 10 banks that we had, or I don't know how many it was at the time, but however many we had, they had ordered mm -hmm. the Apple II version. So we knew that at least if we got that Which you had done, not yet produced. Uh, yeah. yeah, we had to finish <laughs> developing it. You know, and, but then we had standing orders. Yeah. You, these, there, there was demand for it. So we had to get it done. Um, and. Uh, and so we did do that, and we, and we, we finally shipped it in mm -hmm. uh, late of, what was this, 1985, Five. I think it was? Yeah. yeah. So we got a burst of uh, cash. So that it gave us a little burst, burst of cash. Uh, we then uh, had, there were, this was before we had stopped, before we had realized, we, we, we had mm -hmm. stopped selling to the banks. We hadn't yet realized that they weren't going to be successful. So we had a few banks, just coincidentally, that, that uh, we had been talking to for months and months, and they all of a sudden signed up with us. So we got a, another slug of cash. And because we had the, the Apple II version, Apple w had become a real fan of ours. They were a home product, and they needed home titles. And this was a great title for them. And so they actually were actively helping us. Uh, they put us into Apple's, uh, into their stores. They did uh, marketing campaigns. They had one was the, the 12 good reasons to buy an Apple computer that, that Christmas season. And we were one of the 12. And so we got some help there. And that was kind of the, the first little bit of a turning point yep. uh, where we started to get some cash. Um, and there then, were only four of us at yep. that time. Right. And so our expenses were really low. And we had a little bit of cash coming uh, out, and when so we the, actually started. So you decided to advertise. When the bank thing fizzled, basically Tom and I sat down and said, we're either going to go for it and make this big or get out and do something else. Yep. So we then, with Ginny's help, on, we cut the cost of goods dramatically and shipped it not in a box, but just shrink wrap to cut costs. We cut the price in half from 99 bucks to 49 bucks, And then we, uh, worked, uh, we managed through a, a friend to get into some distributors. Because we, we, we had to get into the warehouses that computer stores bought from. So we got into a couple of the warehouses. And then we decided to do advertising. And we tried an ad agency to do a test ad, total dog. And so one of my friends from school and from P&G, Bill Mirbach, who's here, took me under his wing. We couldn't pay him, but he taught me how to write a direct marketing ad. You know, one of those text-heavy things with a coupon and an 800 number. Kind of looked like crap. But it, but it, was, had, it told the story very completely. And so we put the remaining money we had behind the advertising, because we now could get into stores. We had a better price. And then we stood back and watched. And actually, that was a, that was a big decision for us to make, because we were going into the Christmas season of, of 1986 now. And we had to decide, what are we going to do? We've, we had built up this enormous fortune of about $100,000 uh, in the bank. And, uh, well, that's and, why you needed the CFO. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and we had to decide, uh, you know, are we going to run a test ad, see how it works, tweak it until it's really good, and then, and, then, and then ramp up? By the time we would have done that, we would have yep. missed the Christmas season. And so the more prudent thing to do would be test, get it right, and then ramp up. 
But we didn't want to do that. We decided we're just going to go for it. We committed to $125,000 of advertising on $100,000 of cash in the bank. And, and then we did this. Uh, and, uh, you know, guess what happened? You know, we're here today. That means it worked. Yep. And it worked fabulously. Yep. We were, on average, doubling our money every 30 days in those days. We would run an ad for, you know, $10,000 in one of the PC magazines, and we'd get $20,000 of business from it. Eric, was this financially prudent? <laughs> you know, I was, no, I was in the kitchen with them on this, and uh, actually, you know, I, I had the good fortune to arrive just as you know, we were kind of launching a retail strategy, which proved to be successful. You know, it was risky, but I mean, we were arm in arm, 100% aligned that that was the right thing to do. Yeah. And then yeah. when we went back and interviewed the customers who bought and looked for what drove the purchase decision, yeah. there was a chunk for whom it was the advertising, but by far the majority was word of mouth from a friend. Those early users, the Apple stuff, the few units sold by the banks, they, those users were delighted. They told their friends, and the friends started asking for us by name in the stores. So then the stores started ordering it. And it, it was word of mouth was what saved our bacon. And yep. that came from all the intensive focus on ease of use and usability in the product development yep. and the very narrow features so it could be fast and easy. You hit uh, 100 orders in a day which uh, was a great, so there's a, a, a picture of, of a uh, cake and a big celebration if you throw that up. And so this is a $70 billion market cap company, right? Celebrating, um, you know, this was 100 orders in a day. So Amazon gets 100 orders in uh, about two seconds, you know, but this was uh, uh, progress, finally, traction, financially prudent. So then, um, uh, so then we had uh, a second product, right? We started um, uh, looking for uh, broadening what we were doing. And um, talk about that, Tom. That was... Uh... Very, very quick books? Yes. So, well, one of the things that we did from the very beginning is uh, we put in, our, in the, in the uh, box a little uh, business reply card to ask, you know, for your registration, anyone who's... Uh, our age will remember back in the days when you'd buy software, you'd register it. Actually, you probably didn't, but they always asked you to register it. Um, yes. And uh, one of the questions we asked was, do you use Quicken for personal or business use? And we found from the very earliest days, half of our users were telling us that they were using for, for their business use, which made absolutely no sense at all. This was 100% a personal product. It was in a bright, garish, orange box. Looked like a box of Tide oh, from I Proxy. Yeah. 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 We have a picture yeah. of it. It's a good idea. Copy it. Um. And, uh, and there was just no possible way that 50% of people were using it for small business use. So we, we just discounted that, that altogether. Uh, a couple years later, we, we did another round of, uh, of uh, testing of our user base and found the same thing. Half of our users were using for small business. And so we said, I guess that research was not wrong after all. There must be something here. And so we did more research, talked to small business users, and found that you know, the average small business uh, owner, is, his books are pretty much like what we do personally. You, you get bills, you pay them, and you, you know, you, there's not, not a whole lot more complexity to it than that. And so we started uh, adding some small business kinds of reporting and, and features to, to Quicken, but ultimately we knew there's an opportunity here to create a product specifically tailored for small business, and that product became QuickBooks. So tell us about Debella. Eric, what was it like when, uh, uh, now you were on board uh, at the time. Sure. Yeah, tell us about uh, that activity. So we, you know, Tom and I built, you know, DOS Quicken 2 and then 3, and then around the time he was describing, uh, when we were realizing we needed to deliver, you know, a business capabilities. I think, did you introduce us to yes, Rich? Yes, to Rich. I did. Yes, yeah. so, you know, this, this, uh, this guy, Rich, showed up, and he had a, you know, a vision and a passion for uh, creating an easy-to-use uh, piece of software for small businesses. And uh, so we uh, gave him as a starting point the, the DOS Quicken 3 code base, which is probably not the ideal launching <laughs> pad for uh, uh, an accounting product, but uh, he, he rolled with it. And then he spent the next two and a half years working with the team to build um, an entirely new c category of software. We, I think we called it bookkeeping rather than accounting, right. just to distinguish between what we were doing, what everyone else on the market did. And uh, Scott, you're noted for your customer centricity. How did the customers like this product when it first rolled out? Well, the, the How launch. Did work? The, the, 
the launch may not have gone exactly as smoothly as we wanted. Um, first of all, so we, again, we took a very narrow approach, and we had very few features, less than half the features of the other accounting software. But we decided to charge twice the price of the two market-leading accounting software. So maybe we were only off by fourfold. Um, and then we used a novel name, QuickBooks. And uh, we, uh, the marketing, we, now we had, could afford an ad agency. And they had done an ad that was two pages full. It had, they figured accounting is so dull, no one's going to actually look at it if the ad says accounting. So we're going to have to do something else. So they put a big picture of a bald-headed lady. There was a family on pogo sticks. There were pictures of bombs dropping. <laughs> Kelly Nyland did that. And we ran that in PC Magazine, the world's largest trade journal, a million circulation, and got four responses uh, for accounting. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure if we'd ran two blank pages with an 800 number, we would have gotten more than four people calling. But it got better um, because in the, in the production to produce the product, there might have been a bug that slipped in such that after people, businesses had spent weeks typing in all their business data, suddenly one day, poof, all gone. And then our phones lit up, because it's amazing how huffy people get when weeks of work disappears. <laughs> so then are we, we really are focused on customer service, and then no customer could get service, because we never staffed to have everyone call and be angry. So <laughs> that was the brilliant launch of uh, QuickBooks version 1.0. Um, now, what happened is the team got all over the customer service thing first. We doubled the size of the tech support department in a week which is easy to do because we only had to train people on one question. Where the bleep is my data? <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the software team got all over, found there was pointer errors in the database, I think, and figured out how to stop it from happening. And then we sent out multiple disks to repair. And then there was a workaround that we could give you on the phone. We, we bagged the advertising because, well, we didn't want to be advertising when we had a bug. And it wasn't working anyway. Um, so that was the brilliant launch of, of QuickBooks. And then the amazing thing happened. There, there was a market um, share service. All the stores reported their sales of package software. So we could tell our market share down to, down to the single share point. By the end of month two, QuickBooks was the best-selling accounting software in the United States. despite those problems. And we never got closer than double the sales of the next. So we basically like introduced this new soft drink and passed Coke in two months. So how, I don't know if I'll ever see that sort of thing again. But so how did that happen? It turns out it was this discovery that Tom and Eric were talking about. It turns out that all other accounting software and the whole industry believed that accounting software had to be what accountants said it was, which was debits and credits journals and ledgers. Well, actually, who here took accounting in school? Raise your hand if you took accounting in school. OK, that's a lot of hands. Keep your hand up if you love accounting, really understand it. <laughs> OK, almost every hand but one went down. That means you people who put your hands down are what's called normal. <laughs> and if you run a business of, say, six or 12 employees, you don't have room for a CPA on and your staff. You don't have anyone who knows accounting. The books are done by a clerk, office manager, an unfortunate spouse. And as a, the old Hori joke I've told for years, these bookkeepers are the people that think that General Ledger was a World War II hero. <laughs> so when we launched this product that says the first accounting software with no accounting in it, <laughs> it actually was, it man. solved the single biggest problem people had. The users of accounting software didn't understand the system of accounting. So we came out with one that just, you see a check on the screen, you fill it in. You see an invoice on the screen, you fill it in. That was the big number one problem businesses faced in keeping their books, and the product solved it. And that's why it worked. It wasn't the marketing, and yeah. our product quality improved rapidly, but it wasn't the initial quality. So that's- You did what the customer needed. Yeah, and it was totally non-consensus. The experts said we were wrong. The experts yep. are accountants. The magazines gave us lousy reviews. We didn't have many features. So we were That's again. At least a venture capitalist who I'm bored by this time because you finally <laughs> raised some money. Choice. Yes. And uh, so you have, uh, now you have two products. You have uh, Quicken and QuickBooks, um, rising sales, making money, time for an IPO. And um, how'd the IPO go? Tell us about that. 
So we had originally actually planned to do the IPO in uh, uh, 1992, just as we were launching uh, on the strength of the QuickBooks launch. And then for various reasons, uh, we, we, we <laughs> thought maybe we should, work. <laughs> <laughs> we should hold off a little while. But uh, by the end of 1992, I think we were starting to feel like you know, QuickBooks was, uh, was going to be a big hit. Quicken was still doing very well. And uh, we had a board meeting, I think, in John Doerr's office in uh, San Francisco, where John looked at us and said, it's time to put the puck on the ice. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, That's sophisticated uh, VC yeah, talk. Right, right. So, uh, so, <laughs> that, so I think we, we concluded that there was um, some M&A activity in our future. You know, we we're kind of aware of the companies in the tax space, and we didn't want to be the only private company when the relevant uh, players were, were public. And so very, very quickly, you know, from that decision in December 1992, uh, we put pen to paper, or actually keyboard to word processor, at least by then, and uh, put together a prospectus and, uh, in record time and uh, mm -hmm. got out on a road show. And I think it was, uh, well, it was, do you remember the time? time? It was like 60 I days. I thought it was six, 60 days yeah. from that board meeting mm -hmm. decision to our effective uh, date of the yeah, idea, yeah. So which we, was unheard of at the yeah. time. So we, uh, we made up our mind to do it, and we did it. And then got a pretty good outcome. Well, yeah. And, and part of the reason it could go so quickly is we'd been running the company on an as-if public basis. Mm -hmm. And we were really clean. Our books were clean. Our agreements, were, our contracts were clean. Everything we'd really, you know, the integrity quotient was really high. So we didn't have a lot of stuff to have to work through or make adjustments or crazy stuff. At the back of an IPO book, there's this, the appendix with all the rotten stuff in it. And we hardly had an appendix. So <laughs> um, that's what, and then just speed. We, we were worried about the window closing. Yeah, I no, it didn't close for another decade, but we were worried about the window <laughs> closing. Um, and well, we also had the, these MA ideas. deals that we wanted to get done, and we had to we had to go public in order to have the public currency to do them. Yeah. And that was the that was the thing that was really well. Driving. You had uh, so Tom talk about uh, the tax business, the tax. You know, you were because you had now a public currency. You were quite focused on uh, Chipsoft and uh, yep. San Diego and everything. Talk a little bit about how you helped lead the company into that area. Yeah, well, I, I had actually, I don't know where the idea came from, but I, I think it was, you know, just my first exposure to tax software, just because we, my wife and I, or meaning she does it, I watch, uh, would do our taxes, and we discovered tax software, and it was really bad at the, in those days. But it was better than doing it by hand. Right. Um, but it was l little more than just a glorified spreadsheet. But I could see this, you know, this was something that we ought to be in. It, it was an obvious extension. It was an obvious fit for what our company did. Uh, you could even have data flowing from Quicken and QuickBooks into the tax software. So we could, there could be some advantages there. Um, and we could do so much better. Uh, you know, the, the tax software at the time was just basically a, was spreadsheets, and we could do it so much better. We could make it like the rest of the Intuit software, make it, make it easy for people. Uh, mm -hmm. And nobody was doing that yet. And then we discovered, in fact, Eric and I discovered this little company, uh, little tiny company. Uh, this was a couple years before we went public, uh, called Legal Knowledge Systems. Mm -hmm. And they, the founder, it was a company of like six or eight guys, uh, Dan Kane was the founder. He uh, was a, a former uh, tax attorney who had written this program called Ask Dan About Your Taxes. And it was exactly like what, what we had in mind. Uh, 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 it wasn't just a spreadsheet. It would actually interview you and ask you about questions and then fill out the forms for you. And so uh, Eric and I, I think we met him at these industry conferences. Isn't that where we met Dan? Yep, and then Mary Baker, who's yep. in the audience somewhere, and I visited him. Yeah, uh, and, and we got to know him, and, and we thought, you know, just, we should do this. We should we should acquire Dan's company. Dan, you know, was just an engineering firm. He needed somebody that could do marketing. This was an obvious, got to do it. Um, and so I pitched Scott and Eric and Mary, and I we all pitched Scott on it. And Scott said, but how are we going to do the tech support? You know, <laughs> we're going to have this massive tech support burden that's going to all go away on April 16th. How can we possibly deliver world-class tech support? Uh, is how are we going to do it? My feeling was, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We're smart. But this is such a huge opportunity. We should do this. But uh, for, you know, we just couldn't get, we couldn't reach consensus. And so we didn't do it. 
And uh, I was the stick in the mud. You were the stick in the mud, but Tom was right. I, I was right <laughs> on this one. And so, but um, and then as a result, Dan uh, went to our arch competitor at the time, a company called Mecca. Uh, Ooh, and, his. Uh, Ooh. and so they did this partnership where now Mecca had a company, uh, they had a product called Managing Your Money, and they also had now this tax software. So now we had, to, we had to get into the tax business because our competitor had it. And so we ended up partnering with this company down in San Diego called Chipsoft. And uh, they, had a, uh, they had a program called TurboTax. And so for a few years, we would just bundle with, uh, with Chipsoft and we would send our marketing people down to help them do marketing and stuff like that. And uh, we were building up tremendous value in Chipsoft. And uh, we finally decided it's time to stop building value and then we got to acquire these guys. And that's why we needed to go public in order to be able to buy them. So Eric got the company public. You helped get the company into tax. Mm -hmm. You had two prior products that were going along doing great, Quick and QuickBooks. And what does Scott do? He decides someone else ought to be CEO. And, that was a few um, years later, I think, wasn't it? Uh, no, after, after we were in the tax business, it? after we were public. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Tell us about, Scott, you know, this is a lot of people who start companies, who found companies, they think about self-deployment. They think, where can they add value? How, you're still at the company every day now, but years and years ago, you decided you didn't want to be CEO. How, how did that work out? Yeah. You know, the company was growing really fast. Our business had been tripling year after year after year. Uh, and the scale, we got to hundreds and thousands of employees. And of course, the Chipsoft acquisition, Chipsoft was a sizable company. And so that added to the complexity. And I, I uh, my skills were not growing as fast as the company. You know, I, I made a mistake. I didn't have a good coach. I didn't have a coach. I briefly tried. And so I, I wasn't growing fast enough in my ability to handle. And the stuff that most needed time and attention was the stuff I wasn't very good at. So I tended to avoid. And I, boy, after all the hell we'd been through, I didn't want my abilities to cap the success of the company after all the troubles that we had to get started. I didn't want to be the rate limiter. So I figured, well, shoot, I'll, let me, let's hire the best person we can to run the company. Let's give him or her the CEO title so we can get the best person. Um, and so then the, but I decided this while we were in the midst of figuring out what to do with tax, that, that Tom was leading our effort to get into tax and chips off, so I kind of buttoned up on this. And then we had the first board meeting of the then combined companies of Intuit and Chipsoft. And I remember we were at Comdex, and the only room we could get for this was a hotel room at some hotel that was a honeymoon suite with a round bed in it. <laughs> And so here we had a group of new directors who didn't all know each other, and that's when I said, I want to let you know just before, this was an unofficial board meeting, before we even get to our first official one, that I've decided I want to hire my replacement. And I'm not going anywhere, I'll stay at the company, but we need to hire somebody who's got the skills I don't and who will compliment me. And so that's what ultimately, uh, apparently John Doerr argued against it with the other board members behind my back, saying, no, no, no. And they convinced him, yeah, we should do, the, do what Scott wants. And then that led us ultimately to hire Bill Campbell uh, to become our CEO. Bill, of course, is the subject of the new book, Trillion Dollar Coach, uh, which talks about his time in Intuit, his time helping Apple, his time helping Google, uh, creating, uh, on the way to creating a trillion dollar of uh, market uh, value. So you get new leadership in there. And then, meanwhile, Microsoft is uh, increasingly interested in this category. Um, how, um, it, you know, this was before uh, uh, Google was a factor, before Amazon was a factor, um, there was no Facebook. Um, how big did Microsoft loom? Could, Scott, do you, you know, you're the one who oh, yeah. engaged I mean, in this. There's no way today, for people who didn't grow up in that era, there's no way today to understand just how what a behemoth Microsoft was in 1990. Uh, if you combined Apple plus Facebook plus Google into one, that's kind of what Microsoft was. And they had rolled into category after category of software and just rolled over, demolished the incumbents. And they'd done that with 100% success. 
every incumbent was crushed. And those were big companies, like Lotus123 and Word Perfect. And now they were coming after us. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was a defining moment for our company. Because I think all the smart money said, well, Intuit is a puny compared to uh, Microsoft. And from the moment they told us, Microsoft told us in advance, a year in advance, that they would enter with Quicken on, with, a Microsoft, with a Windows product, personal finance on Windows. And they launched it 12 months later, Microsoft money for Windows. Uh, and, and if we had wound up like their prior rivals, again, you know, we'd be serving drinks tonight. We wouldn't be up here. Um, but fortunately, these guys here put together, and with Mary Baker's scorched earth marketing plan, I mean, you saw Eric's number up there. In seven months, we, uh, with people working night and day, we produced a Windows version of Quicken. And then Mary's take no prisoners marketing plan, and by God, we shellacked them. Uh, they got out one month before us, but as soon as we launched, boom, their share just dropped through the floor. Um, it was stunning. It was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> we, <laughs> um, we need to uh, move to the pithy one word of advice uh, that you'll each leave with the audience. Uh, and. Um, Maybe you can each, uh, as we'll go down the row, you can each uh, take a minute and a half, two minutes, to uh, show the audience your word and explain why you find it of great significance as you offer advice. And then uh, we'll begin to move to the uh, Q&A from the audience. So uh, Eric, what uh, profundity do you have to offer? Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take 20 seconds before my profundity to add one name to the names Scott mentioned of a person who was critical to our success in fending off Microsoft. I think he's in the audience. Tim Villanueva and I, yeah. you know, really uh, kind of worked. Yeah. <laughs> we worked hard for seven months, uh, supported by the company and Mary and everybody else. Uh, but you know, he you know, he played an absolutely critical role in our mm -hmm. fighting off Microsoft. My one word is listen, and. Uh, Listen is a couple of things for me. One is something you've already heard. I think it's something our company, Quicken, has inherited from Intuit, which is listening to customers. And so we, you know, we always knew that was important. Uh, it's important in, in what we do now. Uh, and uh, you know, I think many modern companies that are customer-centric uh, pay attention to that. But the other thing Listen is about, I think, is kind of advice for a leader, which sort of reads, for me, humility. Leaders, by nature, talk. And they wave their arms, and they <laughs> present. <laughs> and, and so they project. But maybe it doesn't come quite so naturally to be on the receiving side and to hear what your coworkers, or your employees, or your board members, or your, your spouse <laughs> is, uh, is, is saying. And so I think you know, the best leaders, in addition to having the ability to project and communicate, also take seriously the inbound communication. You know, one of the things we teach at Stanford is that most of us got here with two ears and one mouth, and they're usually best used in that proportion. There you so go. I think mm -hmm. that's a great idea. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Tom? My, my word is persist. Uh, to me, that is the thing that, that I really learned. Uh, we talked a little bit about those dark days uh, at Intuit and where it just never occurred to me that we weren't going to be successful. And, um, in order to succeed as an entrepreneur, there's, there's certainly an element of luck. Uh, any, any entrepreneur that tells you that there's no luck, I don't think you will get an, an entrepreneur that, that succeeded that didn't tell you that there was some luck involved. But in order to have luck happen, you gotta survive long enough for it to happen. And uh, you've, you've gotta, you know, you, no matter what your plan is, you're gonna have to make adjustments. You're gonna have, you're gonna hit the wall, you're gonna adjust. You're gonna hit another wall, you adjust. And the best teams and the companies that succeed in general are the ones that just never give up. You find a way to keep going. We brought in furniture from home. We did what we had to do to keep the doors open because we never lost faith. Uh, years later, I talked to, uh, when we did finally get venture investors, uh, when, when Pete, Pete came in and a couple of other guys, one of the, uh, one of the other investors was Burt McMurtry, who was one of the, you know, the founding uh, members of Silicon Valley. 
venture capital, and I asked him over dinner once, I said, you know, you, Bert, you get all of these business plans every, every week over your desk. What do you look for in a business plan? And, and I thought he'd look at the, he was talking about the financial projections, whatever he says, and nah, nah. he says, I don't look at that, I, say, I know it's bullshit. Uh, just, to be honest, I don't even look at the idea that much because I don't, you know, that's probably wrong too. He says, what I look for is teams because the best teams will find ways to keep going and make the adjustments that they need to make to survive long enough to succeed. So persist is my word, and I've lived by that ever since those dark days went to it. Great. Uh, Scott? I picked self-critique. Everything we do can be improved. And every successful company, nonprofit, educational institution, government needs to be constantly improving. The most important thing to improve is yourself. And if you're not constantly focused on understanding how you're doing, honestly, honestly in the views of others, if you're not critiquing yourself, you're not keeping up your end of the bargain. The most important thing to invest in is improving yourself, and that starts with honest self-critique. Great. Um, we are remarkably on schedule at it's just about 8.05, so that gives us about 25, a uh, little less than 25 minutes for Q&A. We have some great uh, questions from the audience, and some of these will help project us uh, into uh, more contemporary times. Obviously, we focused here on the times that all three of you were at the company and involved. Uh, the first question, um, what has been the number one learning for each of you while starting up into it? What has changed the way that you think today? Number one learning that's changed the way you think today. Eric, you've had a rest for a while. You can uh, start. I think what I learned from Intuit was you can do it. I mean, that, that uh, you, you know, it's not, not to underestimate what you, can, what you can achieve, the degree of ambition that can, you know, that it can actually be li lived up with, the, the impact you can have on the world, the number of customers you can have, uh, the scale you can achieve. And when we were a tiny company, uh, it would have seemed very, very unlikely uh, to, to have grown into it to the scale it's reached today. Uh, so that was important learning for me. Yeah, Tom? Well, you know, persist is, you know, that persistence, the little talk that I just gave you, that's my, that was my number one learning. That's where it comes from, was, was into it. Uh, and I would, but I guess I would add to that just the value that, you know, the, uh, uh, that which Scott is what, who brought this to, the, you know, of really understanding the customer thoroughly before you start writing your first line of code. Uh, you know, really understanding what's the key benefit that, that your, your product needs to deliver better than all alternatives and designing your product to do that. Yeah. Scott, you can have more than one learning. Go well, ahead. <clears throat> one thing I've learned is that, and I think it's a truism, but that behind every successful entrepreneur is a supportive spouse and surprise in-laws. <laughs> um. <laughs> Surprised in laws. <laughs> um, I think one of the early learnings, and we touched on it earlier, was the power of word of mouth. The amazing power of word of mouth um, to build your business. And I guess what I've learned, if I capsulized it, would be what is a brand? A brand is not what you tell customers it is. A brand is what your customers tell the friend, their friends you are. Mm -hmm. Just like the original takeoff of Quicken, you know, the advertising did something, but all the advertising did was get people to talk about it with their peers and with other customers. So uh, there's an interesting question here um, about the culture of innovation. And again, this is a more contemporary uh, question. To it succeeded, in maintaining a culture of innovation, uh, what do you contribute? Uh, what do you attribute the success to? Um, because so many other companies had started innovative, innovative culture, eventually lost it and became just another big company. And yet, into its growth rate, uh, its reputation, its contribution, what, how do you keep that stuff alive? And you're, you know, you're 
still at the company. You're at the spin out of the company. Uh, Quicken now is a spin out, but obviously both you and Tom have been observers for many years. So what, what is it about Intuit that keeps a spirit of innovation, keeps a spirit of high growth? How do you, uh, uh, Scott, why don't you start us off and, and let uh, Tom and Eric uh, chime in? Well, I I'd say we're still working on this. I don't think we have it entirely figured out, but I mean, one is the power of small teams um, to move fast, as the, as the stories here show. The, I, I think the reality is that as companies grow, uh, they get more internally focused, and they get more focused on consensus and everyone agreeing, and yet it's the non-consensus ideas that are the biggest. And the companies that got disrupted, you can talk to Clay Christensen, he'll tell you that in every case they saw the competitors coming. It was not a lack of seeing. They just didn't react to the non-consensus idea. So I think you've got to set up things so small teams and individual entrepreneurs can innovate inside the company on non-consensus ideas that management may not believe in. Um, you know, thank God, I didn't believe this in us going in the tax business, but thank God we did. Um, and we, so the ability to allow teams, part of it's allow an experimentation culture so that people can prove their ideas by being able to run the experiments uh, as opposed to have to prove it with a memo. Um, so that's been, that's one really important chapter is make sure the company makes decisions based on experiments whenever possible. Uh, and that allows the, that means the hippo, the highest paid opinion, isn't the decision maker. It means the experiment is the decision maker. And that's, you know, one thing I've learned is before you get a product, a new product, in the customer's hands, it's a work of fiction. It's a beautiful fiction. You've written it, but it's fiction. Reality, fact starts when real people start, to use, start using something for real. Uh, and the sooner you can make that happen, the sooner you can make decisions that are fact-based rather than fiction-based. And I think the other thing, you, know, you touched a little bit on culture. Uh, you know, we had a culture, have a culture, uh, that, you know, allows failure, allows people to try things, and if they don't work, that's okay. That's, you know, you, you're not in a culture where, you know, we're doing that is discouraged, uh, either implicitly or explicitly. Uh, so I, it, makes it, it makes it safe for people to try things. Uh, and uh, you know that's if you don't have that kind of a safety, a safe culture, you're not going to get innovation. Can I pick up on Tom's point with a data point? We we give innovation awards every year into it to teams or individuals who've done game-changing innovation. And they have to have results in the market. Um, last year, two of the winners, who one of whom has now created the biggest new business in our company's history, another one has the fastest-growing business. Two teams. In each case, they were the fourth attempt at that business in the company. And the first three didn't work, but the fourth one did. You've been watching the movie a long time. Why does it stay so innovative there? Why is it well, constantly I, growing? What, what's so, right? I guess what I'd add to what you know, Scott and Tom said, which I agree with, is that it's sort of a conscious act, and it's sort of been a conscious act for Intuit since around 1990 to innovate. Until then, we just cranked out quick inversions one after the other. And around that point when we had 100, 200 employees, somehow as a management team we decided, you know, we have to, we have to build this in. Tom started leading IntelliCharge, the first, you remember the first <laughs> online banking? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Steve Pelletier uh, came in and said we should spend money developing Quicken software for PDA, so there's almost a version for the Newton and the General Magic and the Palm Pilot, and those were not great businesses, but they were sources of kind of uh, excitement, innovation, experimentation, and uh, that spirit of being open to trying something radically different, I think, was something we consciously built into the company around that phase, and then obviously have kept it going ever since. And then the track record on that, so we were rather early to get into web-based software, where the product ran entirely on the web, so we had uh, Quick, uh, QuickBooks Online and TurboTax Online running in 1999 and 2000. And again, these were small teams, renegade teams who believed this was important, even when there wasn't much business there. 
And then, though we thought we were late on mobile, we were fairly early versus any of our rivals getting our stuff on the mobile phones. Um, and so now when it comes to you know, on tax, for example, the mobile version of TurboTax just crushes all the other competitors because we had years of a head start on them. But again, that was a small team of three people in San Diego at the TurboTax headquarters who just believed this should work and then experimented their way to find how to get it to work. Yeah, so small teams, innovation is a marathon, not a sprint. Maybe it takes uh, three failures before you get the, uh, the big hit or uh, a lot of disappointment before you get to something great. But um, just keep it modest in scale so you don't bankrupt the company and keep trying and keep encouraging and keep supporting and um, everything doesn't work great but you'll get to a good place if you stay at it, mm -hmm. part of your persistence. Persist. Mm -hmm. um, if you were um, to be able to go back in time for each of you, um, what would have you done differently? How would you, uh, how would you rewrite the past? Well, you get one little thing you can twitch your nose and change. Mm. Uh, what is it? Uh, Go ahead. Well, I, I would say... Don't use basic. <laughs> no, well, no, no, no. Uh, to, to me, the, 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 uh, the biggest personal difference for me, or the thing I would have done is, um, you know, 1993, when we did the, the IPO and the, the acquisition of Chipsoft, and, and, and there was a lot more to it than that. It was a very complicated uh, deal. And, and, and I, I, I was really burned out at the end of that. I had been traveling constantly. Uh, and just needed some time off. And uh, so after we got through kind of the transition of bringing uh, chips off in, I said, I'm, I'm gonna, I gotta take a sabbatical. I just gotta recharge my batteries. And that was when we brought Bill Campbell in. And uh, Bill talked to me and said, hey, I want you to, uh, you know, when you're done with your sabbatical, I want you to come back and uh, start our international business. And I thought, gosh, you know, I got kids now and I'm not seeing them and now just, you know, I, I need to, and, th and that's when my sabbatical became a permanent one, when yeah. I said it. My biggest disappointment, looking back, is that I never had the chance to work with Bill Campbell. Yeah. I really wish I hadn't found a way. I should have, yeah. I should have said to Bill, well, I don't want to do that, but let's find something else for me to yeah. do, because I really want to work with you. But I didn't know. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. One, uh, Eric, one uh, do-over? I just feel so fortunate in, you know, how events played out during my association with Intuit. There's, not, you know, not a lot that I would have done differently. Even my worst mistake turned out okay, which is when I kept a copy of your facts about Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so I mean, worked, worked I mean, out very well. <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I'm sure I made lots of mistakes, but none that I could invent the better answer to. Right, yeah. Scott, what's your yeah. do-up? I'd, I'd yeah. pick a very personal one. Uh, I should have gotten a coach. Uh, as the company was starting to grow and as when we had the money to afford one, I should have gotten an executive coach. Uh, and I didn't. Uh, years later, we have uh, a man on the outside, Justin Sherman, who's sitting right there, who has been an executive coach to a number of our executives. And I saw, this is now 12, 13 years ago, I saw his work with our execs and I said, oh, that's pretty good. I, I could probably use that. You know, I'm the only guy here who doesn't get a performance review. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, may maybe I got some deferred maintenance. I, I <laughs> need a tune-up. Uh, so Justin came in and uh, did a 360, and oh my God, did I have deferred maintenance. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of things I was doing that I just didn't understand or wouldn't admit to myself where I was screwing up, screwing up teams, other leaders, and it's been phenomenal. It's been the best thing, um, well, after marrying Signe. Um, the, um, so I got a coach at work, a coach at home. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's been phenomenal, a journey of discovery about how to improve the skills that I bring, thanks to having someone who's my coach. So that's the thing I wish I'd done early. Yeah. Uh, so this next question is from someone who's obviously under 30. Back when they had physical boxes of software, how did you actually make and process this? <laughs> I, I tell you, that oh, we was... We have a box, a photo, please. We have a that box was of the a, best of part. software. Yeah. There you go. 
Look that, at that beautiful box. Yeah, there you go. I tell you. So, so how does this companies today? You do not know what you are missing. It was so <laughs> gratifying when we would get an order and we would have packing parties because we would buy all these the materials that go into this: the box, the sleeve, the manual, the, the disc. sample checks, the disc itself. All these parts would come to us. And we'd have to ins uh, assemble them together and shrink wrap them and put them into cases and tape them up. And then the UPS guy would come and cart them away. That is the most exciting, fun thing you can yep. do. It yep. is such a tangible evidence of yep. your work yes. uh, versus a web app. I mean, what yeah. do you see? You see numbers going up. Big deal. <laughs> Yeah, but, your, uh, Eric, your introductory number said you got to repackage 20,000. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Now I remember what my mistake was. <laughs> 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 right. Because, yeah, don't mistake an unsigned 32-bit integer for a 30, signed 32-bit integer when you're designing a, <laughs> a flag in Windows in DOS Quicken 2.0. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that, that was, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how I missed all my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was the cause for those 20,000 replacement disks. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, Scott and Tom, bless them. You know, <laughs> all they said is, you sure you fixed it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna but you got, just you got to remember one thing to add is we had a big hair dryer and you shrink wrap the box and one of the most fun things was shrink wrapping with a hair dryer one <laughs> box at a time. <laughs> oh, that was fun. And um, uh, some more uh, questions about the failed Microsoft acquisition and, and how do you um, uh, how did it affect you? How did you lead the company? out of that uh, because it looked like it's something that didn't work out? How do you keep people's drive for success when something big and visible like that doesn't go forward? And again, a lot of companies in the Valley where stuff like that happens. Yeah, so the background of the story was well, one day I was doing email and I got an email from a Bill G at Microsoft.com. <laughs> and the first line of the email read, this really is Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there must have been a Bill Gates impersonator out there or something. <laughs> and he expressed in the email he wanted to get together and talk. He really admired the company. And he really wanted to get us together and have us come into Microsoft. And so we, I responded that we're not interested in selling, um, but that uh, you know, I'd be glad to talk and see if we work out a partnership or something. So we had discussions back and forth for a while and finally wound up uh, agreeing to be acquired by Microsoft. And in return, they would take their Microsoft Money product, the directly competing product, and give it to Novell because of antitrust concerns. So there would still be Microsoft Money, I guess it would be Novell Money on the market. And that we would become the head of all of their e-commerce and digital commerce work, as well as their finance and, and, and accounting work. Uh, so that's, and we finally, through laborious negotiations, I did part of the price negotiation on a pay phone at Lake Tahoe. Uh, because the cell phone wouldn't work back then there. But we got to a final agreement, and it was announced. Um, and we had Bill down, and we announced it to the company. And I'd say the company employees were kind of, mm -hmm. because they'd been fighting and winning against Microsoft. And Microsoft was the enemy. And the idea, we kind of thought it was a great idea, but it kind of went over like a lead balloon with the employees, uh, with the rest of the team. So, but then there, <clears throat> we knew there'd be antitrust review. And so there'd be this period of pendency. And our goal would be to gain as much share, market share as we could against Microsoft during this period of time. So if the deal got broken up, we would come out as far ahead as we could. So we you know, said to everybody, look, we're not married yet. We're engaged, but we're not married. So we're going to compete hard as fast as we could. And of course, the Microsoft team was demoralized because they had just been told by their boss they were going to wind up in Salt Lake City working for another company if they chose. <laughs> Nothing against Salt Lake, great skiing, but it was, it's not Microsoft. And so uh, what are, any, any chapters of the story that we should add? Well, I, I mean, I just remember uh, this, was, this all happened while I was on sabbatical. And uh, you know, when I learned about it, I was thinking, OK, what I want to have happen was I want this thing to drag on for a while and let's ride up the stock price because we were getting a lot of attention. But ultimately, I want it to blow up and uh, because I was you know, hopeful that when it did, our stock price would stay at this new high. And I believe that's exactly what ended up happening. So to, mm -hmm. one point is we were building our on online banking business uh, at the time. 
and we needed credibility so that you know you could go into you know Citibank and Bank of America and Wells Fargo and have some clout. And so being the designated finance solution of Microsoft, I think radically improved our stature during that period and helped us get a very strong start in online banking. As it turned out, you guys are both on it. As it turned out, banks and others complained mightily to the Justice Department, and for whatever reason, the Justice Department decided to sue to challenge the combination, at which point Microsoft said, we're not up to fight the challenge, we're out of here. So yeah. we were suddenly independent, but as Eric indicated, we were now the chosen product by company by Microsoft, but now we were defanged. Microsoft was no longer part of it. So suddenly the banks all over the world wanted to work with us. Yeah. <laughs> it was the most amazing surprise. Mm. Uh, and the stock, then when the deal was announced, the stock dropped first thing in the morning, but then a bunch of investors went in and bought like crazy. And of course our stock had been bid up because of the acquisition. It dropped and then a bunch of investors came and we were high sailing from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and economically? Well, we agreed to sell to Microsoft at a, a billion and a half. Our deal was pegged to their stock price, so by the time of the breakup uh, of the acquisition, it was about 2.2 billion, and today our market cap is 66, 66 billion. And we got a breakup fee of... Oh, we had a huge breakup fee, yeah. yeah. That was like, nice. Yeah, so we got extra cash, and we, we really fee. always want the cash. 85. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like Another... Uh, Thank uh, God for unanswered favors. Yes, right? that, that is a <laughs> Garth Brooks prayers. song. Thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> this was certainly one of those cases. Um, our uh, final question, I'll embellish a bit, but basically uh, talks about the fact that, listen, this company has run for 38 years. No scandals, no drama, no ethical lapses. Um, in today's world, how do you do that? Um, <laughs> I want to read uh, this. Uh, Scott uh, did an article years ago about the ethics of bootstrapping, especially when the company was so uh, uh, ne needed something. Uh, when you're a little struggling startup, you're confronted by ethical questions every day. Your company has no visible track record or a very limited one, or in our case, some past product issues. Uh, poor selling products, several years, no money, uh, closest competitors well capitalized. That's the rest of your ethics when you're starting straight, you're staring failure straight in the eye. Each week, your ethics are challenged by the promises you make, the promises you make to each other, the promises you make to customers, the promise you, promises you make to employees and to prospects. What do you have to tell them to get you to do, to get them to do what you want? How can you do that? Talk about the ethics on which the company has been built, the values. Um, how have things gone so well for so long? Observers and then the one who's been there. <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's really a culture. And I think that, you know, the culture starts at the top. And, um, you know, Scott and I and Eric and, the, and Ginny and the early employees, we were all just, you know, we were ethical people. It would never occur to us to not be ethical. And, and so we have an ethical cu culture at the company and we lead by example. Uh, and we're not, you know, I mean, and it's genuine. You know, when we screwed up with customers, we did right by the customers. Um, when we had a bug, uh, you know, we spent, you know, days just duplicating disks to send out to people for free. Obviously, it's going to be for free. But you know what we learned was that, that when we screwed up with customers, it was an opportunity to handle that screw up so well and blow the customer away. You could actually turn a negative into a positive by just how well you handled it. And we did that over and over again. And we celebrated. Uh, within the company when, when employees would do those kinds of things. And, and uh, you know, we had tech support people that would, you know, get a call from people uh, that happened to be nearby, and they would actually go to their house and help them, you know. And these are just the kinds of heroic things that, that people did in our company without being told. And then we would, and we made sure that the rest of the employees would know about it. So it would just help build this culture. Eric, how do you keep Yeah, and just to pick up 
exactly from where Tom left off, we did something very important in 1993 just before we went uh, public. We, 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 we recognized we had a good culture and we wanted to kind of capture that and make sure that it was preserved and, and, and grew. And we had a, a process, vision, mission, op, Vimova, vision, mission, operating values, achievements, where we wrote down the things that were important. And responsive to your question, we wrote down integrity without compromise, not even close to the line. Right. That's how we behaved then, and we wanted to write it down so it would be part of the company going forward as it has been. Right. And Eric insisted it be value number one. Mm -hmm. I, the backstory on that article is that this is when we were struggling. We'd, we'd gotten through the dark days, but Inc. Magazine called up saying, hey, we're doing a story. And we're do doing a story on kind of all the little cheats and tricks that small companies have to do to compete with the giants. You know, those things that you kind of sneak around the edges on because, you know, our readers want to know and they're looking for tips. And I said, well, gosh, I'd dearly love to be in your magazine, but I got to say, I entirely disagree with your thesis. If you build a company on cheats and tricks, you're building a company on a foundation of sand and it'll wash away. So I'm sorry, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have anything to contribute. Boy, we really needed the publicity. Um, <laughs> there's uh, but then, hopefully, hopefully there's helpful lessons in tonight's panel. Uh, in a moment, let me just add, Peter, one quick thing. Then they called back two weeks later and said, "You know, we really liked your point of view. Can you author a sidebar we'll put next to the article?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's the ethics of bootstrapping that uh, Pete is reading. From. Um, I hope there's been uh, lessons. Uh, of interest here, enduring lessons. Uh, this company has won uh, a lot of awards. We have a great uh, picture from many years ago we have put up of the founders uh, being recognized. This was, uh, but uh, super Dapper. picture. Your questions have been great. Great audience, panel, super job. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>